Our speaker is the wonderful Keisha Gillis. She is a project-based consultant. She's going to be talking about, as I previously mentioned, interview with confidence. She is a consultant who is passionate about helping small business owners and entrepreneurs take their business to the next level. As a project-based consultant, she helps you create a to-do list, and together she will help you scratch things off one project at a time. <clears throat> She has a vast skill set and can assist you with process development, strategic marketing, and or bookkeeping. In addition to projects, she offers training courses that help you grow personally and professionally. With more than 10 years of experience in training and development roles in corporate America, she utilizes a personable approach to connect with her class. She conducts workshops on a variety of topics, including personal financial management and small business boot camps. When she's not meeting with clients or teaching, she's out collaborating with members of her women's group, Ladies in Alignment. Her group uh, hosts social activities, personal and career development workshops, and volunteer activities. She serves on the board of Youth Rise Texas, a nonprofit that works with teens who have a parent who has been incarcerated or deported. Oh gosh, what a need. She also serves on the board of the Rose Project, a nonprofit that encourages young women to develop and grow using four principles, responsibility, originality, support, and exploration. Rose. She is a proud Tennessean, but we love her in Texas, and holds a bachelor's in marketing from, from the University of Tennessee. Welcome, Keisha Gillis. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate the love, even though I am a sea girl. Um, very proud of that Tennessee part. Um, but I'm happy to be in Texas. I've been here almost nine years um, and absolutely love it. Today, we're going to be talking about interviewing with confidence. And let me just pull up that screen. We're going to present. All right. So interviewing with confidence. Um, you know, it, it can be nerve wracking. I mean, we're, we're in troubling times where, you know, the unemployment rate is so high and our political climate is chaotic and there's racial tensions and there's so many things going on in our lives that it's really hard to remain positive sometimes. But we cannot take that negativity into an interview. We've got to be able to find that inner confidence and positive mindset so that we can interview um, effectively. So let's start from the very beginning. Define your definition of confidence. So there was a couple of definitions that I found. The first one being a feeling of our consciousness of one's power. We have powers. We have talent. We have purpose. Um, and we need to take that in with us when we go into an interview. Um, as well as the faith or belief that one will act in a right, proper, or effective way. So you got to believe and have faith in your ability to be able to do the job. Um, and bring that with you when you come, when you go into that interview, whether it be via Zoom or in person, you got to have faith and a belief in yourself because, again, you hold the power and the ability to be able to make it happen. And so when you think about confidence, there was a couple of synonyms, a few synonyms, 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 <laughs> synonyms um, that came to mind. So self-assurance, self-trust. Self-esteem, those are all things that are highly important and a part of having confidence. But let's look at the opposite. The antonyms are insecurity, self-doubt, self-trust. So if you're not confident, then that is what you're putting off. If you're not coming in with confidence, then to the interviewer, to that employer, they may see you as insecure. They may believe that you have self-doubt in your ability to do the job, that you distrust your effectiveness. So you definitely have to focus on the positive, focus on your own internal powers and your talents and your skill set, and have that faith and belief that you're going to make things happen and that you'll be able to do this job effectively. So, I'm so cool that um, Indeed is one of your platinum sponsors because I actually saw an article that they did that talked about the 14 common qualities that employers are looking for um, in, in their employees. And what we found is that um, confidence, it, it gives you, it's a characteristic that they're looking for because um, when you're confident, you're friendly, you're engaging, you're a team player. Um, you also have ideas and, and you'll be able to present those um, and have, excuse me, have clear goals and you'll be able to present those effectively. So, you know, they're definitely looking for people that have that confidence 
and can bring it to the team and be a valuable asset. So again, that's one of the top 14 qualities that employers are looking for. So it's very important that you walk into those interviews with the confidence. But how do you do it, right? How are we gonna get that job? Well, there are nine ways to interview with confidence um, that I wanna walk you through today. And we'll talk about each one. Um, the first one being power posing. So if you haven't done this before, it is a powerful tool. You can do it um, before the interview, like before you get on the call. I'm not going to lie, I did it this morning. Um, but basically, you just stand in a posture that you mentally associate with being powerful. So a lot of people will stand with their arms on their hips, um, legs kind of spread out, um, uh, even with their shoulders. And, and it's like a superwoman pose or Superman pose. Um, and that just gives you that extra air and that extra boost of confidence. It gives you some assertiveness. Um, to go in with authority. So power posing is something you could do before that big interview. Power posing is something you could do, you know, anytime you need to add that additional confidence or you want to feel like you're in charge, power posing works. The next thing is the confidence mirror. Now with the confidence mirror, um, it's, it's a confidence building exercise. And what it does is it helps you subconsciously to, to feel more confident confident um, in, in, in a matter of just minutes. Um, there was a movie, that, there's a TV series that I used to watch called Being Mary Jane. And in that, she kept positive affirmation on her bathroom mirror. So every day when she started her day, she had those affirmations that she read to herself. And every night before she went to bed, she did the same thing. And that was able to build her confidence in her ability to do different things. So having that confidence mirror, literally putting those positive affirmations on your mirror so that you can see those every night and every morning, um, and pretty much anytime you go to the bathroom, just take a glimpse at that. Or if you just need that extra boost of confidence, they recite those positive affirmations and realize that you got this, okay? You have the power um, and believe in your ability uh, to get things, the ability to get things done. So the confidence mirror is a great way to start your day and end your day with a positive note. Now, the next one is effective memory. When you think about, um, you know, method acting, so these actors, they have to, when they're doing a, um, a somber scene, they, they think back to a sad moment in their life and that's how they're able to pull the tears out and, you know, pull that emotion to put into that role. Well, I want you to think to a time of when you had an effective interview or, um, you know, an, an effective meeting with someone. Um, and if, if, if you feel like I'm, I'm terrible at interviews, I'm always nervous, I have a hard time, you know, going in with confidence. Well, think about maybe when you met your significant other's parent for the first time and you really liked this person. So you came in and you gave a strong handshake. You made sure that you uh, made eye contact that you are articulate and you really express yourself um, because you wanted to make a great first impression. So think of a time in which you just healed that first interaction. Soak up all the positive energy associated with that so that um, when you walk into that interview or you, or you log in and do that Zoom interview, um, that you're reflecting back on that. And so it'll kind of be like deja vu and you'll think back to a time that you killed it and it'll help you be more effective um, in that interview. So just channel a, a positive experience that you've had and use that to propel you um, to do a great job in that next interview. Now, these next two are, are important. So mastery, um, when you, if you have experience, experience and confidence usually go hand in hand. If you're going in for an interview for a position that you're very confident in, maybe you've done that type of work for the last 10 years, that confidence is there because you know without a shadow of a doubt that you can do that job. So confidence is not a problem. You're, you're, you're qualified, you've got it. But what if you're early in your career or you're short on experience? This is a new career path for you. And so that confidence level may not be as high because you really don't have the experience to come along with it, right? 
Well, in that case, that's where you got to do the homework, right? So you want to read, you know, relevant books. You want to go to the internet and do different searches and find, do some research, um, take training courses. So, you know, Cliff mentioned a lot of different opportunities with ACC, the career and uh, professional training uh, programs that they have. So looking into some different training courses. And then another great resource is to find a mentor. Find someone that's in that field, that's doing the work, and get some advice from them. You know, talk to them about what they can expect and, um, you know, um, and let them maybe even do some mock interviews for you. Um, because they're in that role already, they'll really be able to prepare you um, to walk into that interview. So find a mentor. But once you know what you know and you have that, that, that knowledge base, that really, really helps you build confidence because you know what you're talking about, you know the industry, you know the job description, um, anything that they throw at you, you're already going to be prepared to handle those questions because you've done your homework and you, when you have more energy, you definitely feel better. It makes you feel better about yourself um, and, and, and just changes that mood. So, you know, going for regular exercise, going for walks, especially before an interview, is really going to help boost some of your energy level and your confidence. And then also the way that you dress. So I got up and got dressed today and put on a business casual outfit because I wanted that extra boost of confidence. Um, so of course, you know, dressing professionally is not something that anybody would have to tell you to do. You know, it's something that we know as an interview skill to make sure that you dress appropriately. But there's other layers to that. So for example, for me, when I need an extra boost of confidence, I wear my mama's shoes. Um, I'm blessed that me and my mom have the same size shoe. So I can actually wear her shoes and it just gives me that extra, you know, boost of confidence because I, that's my she rose. And, you know, a lot of times when I wear her shoes, I get a lot of compliments because mom has great fashion sense. Um, another thing I do is, um, you know, my grandmother passed away a couple of years ago and I got wear, you know, a bracelet that I have of hers. You know, anytime I need a little extra boost of confidence, I can touch that bracelet and I hear her say, baby, you can do anything you want to do, you know, and it just, it warms my heart. It makes me smile. Um, it, it just really, really helps me channel a positive attitude. So, you know, when you think about the way you dress, it's not just dressing business casual or professional, but accessorize yourself or keep something in your pocket or, you know, that makes you think of something very positive. Um, and that'll help you in those times where you get a little nervous or uncertain, you know, me touching that bracelet that my grandmother had um, just, just it automatically makes me smile and gives me that confidence because she always believed in me. And that means I should believe in myself. And remember, belief and faith is part of building confidence. Focus on the positive. So I've said positive, I don't know how many times today. Um, but Dr. Maya Angelou, one of my favorite authors, um, she said, at the end of the day, people won't remember what you said or did. They will remember how you made them feel. So focus on the positive. When you go in for that interview, if it's in person, when you speak to the receptionist, be positive, be complimentary. Um, when you talk, when you meet the interviewee or the interviewer, you know, the same thing. Just exude positivity, be complimentary. Um, be a champion of confidence for others. Because when you compliment others and you, you boost other people's confidence, it not only makes you feel good and help by helping them, but it also gives you greater confidence as well. So focus on all the positive things. Focus on the fact that it's a beautiful day. Yes, it's hot, but still a beautiful day in Texas. Um, and you have the power to change your environment. So when you walk into the room, change the atmosphere. Be positive, keep a smile on your face, um, and just be that champion of confidence for others to help you increase your confidence level as well. Now, body positioning. So body language, it tells the truth, okay? Whether it be your facial expressions, whether it be the way that you're sitting, um, it really reveals whether or not the candidate is confident, goal-oriented, and focused. Um, and it also can tell if you're actually bored, insecure, or nervous. So think about when somebody's really listening to you and they're really engaged in that conversation with you, how do they look? Do they lean in? Are they smiling? Like, what, how can you tell when somebody's really paying attention to you? That's what you want to mirror. 
You want that person that's interviewing you to know that you are paying attention, that you're focused, um, and that you, your, your body language should share that. And it should share the next thing, which is that you're going to be present, stay connected, fully engaged in the process. So you want to make that connection with the interviewer um, by making sure that when they ask you a question that you give a helpful and confident answer that's right on target with what they ask. Uh, being actively interested in what they have to say. Um, so it's not just like listening to respond, which is something that I think we've all been guilty of at some point, but it's, it's listening to, to get the full um, conversation and get the full meaning of what they're trying to, to say. So listen effectively and then pause and give a strong re response, but always be present and make sure that your, your responses show that you were listening fully. And then going back to the body positioning, making sure that your body shows that you're fully engaged and connected um, and alert and paying attention in that conversation. Another thing I'll note about being present is also being observant and doing personal observations of the room or of that person. You know, so if, for example, if, if I'm in that person's office, I'm going to kind of check and see if they have a call that to attention. Hey, SEC proud. Um, but, you know, be present and pay attention to things in the room. That'll help you make connections with the interviewer and show that you are, you know, paying attention, shows how you're able to be personable and how you're able to connect. Because that is important when you're going into a new job situation. They need to know that you're going to be able to fit in with the rest of the staff, that you're going to be able to be a strong asset and be able to work well, work well with the people around you. Um, and what better way to show that than making a strong connection with the person that's doing the interview. And then this is important just in life in general, but we'll talk about it as an interview uh, thing. So rewrite your self-talk. So what are your low confidence triggers when interviewing? Um, maybe you hate situational questions. You know, tell me about a time when you had a disruptful uh, customer. What did you do, right? And then you, you, you have trouble kind of thinking back to a particular situation. Or, you know, when they ask you about your strengths or weaknesses, you know, what are your low confidence triggers when interviewing? Like what causes you to, to uh, doubt yourself? So write down what you're saying to yourself when those events occur. So, for example, if it's, you know, asking you those situational questions, you may say, oh, I'm terrible at this, or I have no idea what to say, or I always come up with the wrong response. Write down what you're telling yourself internally um, when that happens and how it makes you feel. And then get rid of all of that negative self-talk. Mark all that out. Rewrite it with positive and assertive manner. So, you know, um, no, yes, I've, I've been in these situations. I've had this happen to me. All I've got to do is reflect back to those times, and I can tell them exactly how this happened. I have the ability to do that. These things have happened to me. I have the knowledge. I can do it. So this is important for, especially for interviews, but it's just important in general. If you're talking negatively to yourself, if you're telling yourself, you know, not so nice things, Write those things down and then rewrite them with a positive affirmation, okay? Do not allow yourself to talk down to you. You wouldn't talk down to other people, so why would you talk down to yourself, okay? It's part of being self-confident and building your self-esteem. Um, but rewriting your self-talk is, is very important, again, not just for um, interviews, but just in general. So I really, really loved this, this exercise. Um, and then last but not least, the final decision is yours. You're in control of your destiny. So yes, you're applying for a job and they're going to tell you whether or not you got it. But the truth of the matter is, you don't have to take that job. If, some, if, if you offered you a job and maybe you went in and maybe you just didn't get good vibes or maybe you had another offer on the table, either way, when they offer you the job, you're in control of your destiny. You decide whether you say yes or not because you are the asset. You're the one that's going to be doing the job effectively. You're the one that's going to be taking that company to the next level. This is your decision. So you walk in with the confidence, with the, with the ability that, and the faith that you know you can do this job, that you will be an asset to this company, and they will be lucky to have you. And then when you get that positive response come back in, you decide for yourself, is this a part of what you should be doing? Is this how you should, is, is this the job for you? Um, you know, what questions do you have for me about finding strategies to build your confidence?
No, um, I'm trying to think of times when I have been panicked, which um, I'm not, it's, uh, sometimes it's, it has to do with what role I'm in. If I, I can stand up in front of people when I'm teaching and I'm fine and uh, I don't get, I don't get flustered, but boy, you put me in a, in certain situations and I'm a nutcase. Uh, and so I, I would love some tricks um, other than just, um, you know, a, a big shot of Jack Daniels before I'm put in those positions. I don't know anything else to do, but, but I don't know. If, all, I don't know if, if big, deep, deep, deep breathing is, that's the way to do it. But anyway, I've really yeah, embarrassed I'm myself a time or two. Yeah, as a Tennessee girl, I really appreciate the Jack Daniels. Um, I'm a Tennessee honey girl. That's my favorite Jack Daniels. Um, and that does give you an extra boost of confidence. Um, but I think it is, um, you know, the positive affirmations, they're, they're really good in that it's something, it, once you memorize them and once you hold them as true, when you have that little bit of self-doubt, those things will pop up in the back of your mind. And you can always recall on those things. Um, another trick for me is, again, this bracelet, this is my grandmother's bracelet. So I can't have a bad day when I have this on because she was such a ray of sunshine. She was everything to me, still is. And, you know, anytime I, I feel nervous or I feel like, oh, gosh, I'm doing a terrible job, I couldn't do a terrible job to her. Like, I couldn't do anything wrong. I was, I, was, I was her baby, you know. And so that'll always help me kind of center myself. Um, you mentioned deep breathing, um, you know, going in it beforehand, like taking those deep breaths, doing that power pose, um, you know, and just kind of building up that confidence and, and you know, keeping, keeping strong hold on that so that you don't get flustered. Host and training seems hard to fake. Um, I'm not sure what that means. Host and training seems hard to fake technical proficiency. Uh, what is your take on fake it till you make it? It's pertaining okay. to the trick. So I, I took a job uh, years ago working for a software company, and it was in the power industry. And my parents had worked in the power industry, but I had no idea. So I'm, I'm dealing with air quality, and there were boilers and turbines and, you know, SO2 and NOx and CO2 and all these things, and I had no idea what I was talking about. And my boss's response to me, and I was a trainer, so I'm going into that same situation. I'm supposed to be teaching people this information. <clears throat> And he told me, fake it till you make it. Um, fake it till you make it is hard. Um, for me, the way that I did it is I made personal connections. Um, I hit him with that southern twang because everybody loves it. Um, <laughs> and I would just try to connect with the, with the <clears throat> very upfront that I don't know everything. I'm new. I'm learning. I do not know everything. If you ask me a question I don't know the answer to, honey, I'm going to tell you. I don't know. <laughs> I know somebody that does know. I have a team of people back at the office. I have people that can help me. So just know that any information I gave you, I know it because I've learned that far. I'm still in the learning process. I'm going to learn for you. And if we both get stumped, I'm going to go back to the people that know that they know, and I will get that answer for you. And so making it till you make it, me, it's being honest the whole time, right? And just telling you from the giddy up, this is where I'm at. I'm in the process of learning. I'm going to learn from you. You're going to learn from me. And if we get stumped, I'm going to go to the, the, the source and get that information. Okay, here's this question. This lady says, I was in an online tech programming class recently where the host training lacked confidence, couldn't answer the most basic programming questions, kept deferring to the co-host to explain. That made me wonder, are there situations where that popular saying, fake it till you make it, does not apply? Yeah, and so for me, like that, I've been in those situations where you just, you, you're brand new and you may not have all the information that you need. Um, and so for me, like I've been told to fake it till I make it, but I'm just, I just, I'm just honest up front. And I tell them, you know, I'm, I'm learning. Uh, and I may have to, you know, refer to somebody else, but we're going to learn together and building that relationship in the beginning to let them know that, you know, you, you are smart, you do have knowledge, but you're, you're on that learning curve. And I try to make that connection with my audience so that they know that. Okay, learning together. Uh, tell us a little bit more, 2,000 members in your Rose group, can you tell us a little bit more about what that group is? 
Yes. Yeah, so um, Ladies in Alignment, um, I started that group, um, oh gosh, I think we're knocking on six years. Um, and it honestly started, uh, I, I'm, I've mentioned my grandmother, I'm very close to my grandparents. And, you know, I moved from Tennessee and came here, I didn't know anybody. And during their transition, when they got sick, I would, I would go to Tennessee and then I would come back and I would be really depressed. And I just, I couldn't get out of it. And I realized I needed friends and I needed people to help me get out of it. So I started, you know, letting people know, hey, I'm coming back from Tennessee this week. Can we go to happy hour? Can we do brunch? And so we started doing that and it went from, you know, three or four people. And the next thing I know, I had 20 people at a brunch and they said, we should do this more often. We need a group. So I created a group on Facebook and then it's just kind of grown from there. Um, we started out just doing social events. Um, like I said, happy hours, brunches, dinners, you know, once or twice a month. Um, and then I would just meet with the ladies in the group one-on-one -on -one, because all these fabulous women started adding that I didn't know. And I felt like, well, if you're in my group, I should know you. So we would meet for coffee or tea and, you know, just kind of connect on how we could be a resource to each other. And in that, I learned that there were so many knowledgeable women, you know, recruiters that could tell us how to get our LinkedIn and our resumes together. So the first workshop that we actually did was on boosting our resume. Um, and it was from somebody that had been a recruiter for 20 years. So it was, it was amazing. Um, but we, we started doing the workshops and seminars, and then I've always had a heart for volunteer work. I think it's because I'm a volunteer, Tennessee, Tennessee Vol. Um, but then we started incorporating volunteer work. So pre-pandemic, um, for the last couple of years, every other month, we serve a meal to the residents at Foundation Community. Um, we come in um, and we usually have anywhere from 20 to 30 residents that'll come down and we have a home cooked meal. Sometimes we do breakfast, sometimes we do lunch um, and we just share a meal with them and sit down and have a conversation and, you know, just enjoy some quality time uh, with those residents. So it's been a way to, to connect with women and it's also been um, a saving grace for me, you know, personally and mentally, you know, having people that I can call on. And, you know, for those people that just moved to Austin that are in the same situation I was where they didn't know anybody, they can join and say, hey, I just moved here. I've got a 14 year old. I have no idea where to take him. You know, where are some good places? Where can he hang out? You know, and, and moms will say, oh, girl, take him to the main event. And I have a 14 year old. Where's he going to school? We could do, you know, we could get them together at the park or you know, and women just come together to connect. It's all about the connection. So that's, that's Ladies in Alignment in a nutshell. That's interesting. Uh, I did a, pr a presentation one time on stress and they had done lots and lots of studies on, on males uh, and how they react to stress. And it's that whole fight or flight uh, syndrome. And they said, these are the chemicals that come into your body. It's adrenaline and it's this and it's uh, testosterone because you're under stress and you have to do those things. And then they had never done tests on women they, because they just assumed that women reacted in the very same way. And when they started to um, do some more studies on how women and women's bodies, women's physiology uh, reacts to stress, they discovered that it's a different set of chemicals that uh, go through a woman's body when she's under stress. And one of the, um, caveman era uh, tendencies is that uh, women have a tendency to, um, to gather together, to band together, because in our most primitive lives, the men had to go defend the tribe and the women had to defend the children. Uh, and the women would band together to, to protect and nurture the children. And it's this sharing of, um, uh, this tendency for women when they're in trouble to share, to share mm -hmm. conversation, to share support, to that's, that's just how they react. And men uh, tend to react differently. So your reaction to, to your sadness about your grandparents uh, to, to say, I need, I need some um, connection. I need mm -hmm. uh, help is it's a very primitive response and, and you apparently have leveraged it into this huge successful organization. So kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I especially saw that during Hurricane Harvey, because there were several ladies in the group whose, you know, families, hometowns were underwater and had lost everything. And they just posted in the group. 
and or they reached out to me individually and we we have a paypal account and everybody just started donating and we were able to um send there was two young ladies that went home to take care of their families and we were able to provide um I think it was 150 each, $150 worth of groceries and supplies that they could take um, with them. Um, and then we also um, helped families that were re re that relocated here and came here. Um, we were able to, we had funds available so that as needs came available and I was contacted, you know, with different um, needs, ladies in alignment was able to come through and do that. So exactly right. You know, when, when people, were in need and their families were in need, all they had to do was make one post or, you know, reach out to me and the rest of the group just came together. And whether they had $5 or $50, they gave and they gave freely and we were able to, to help out families. Uh, here's a question. <clears throat> How do we, mostly women, but everybody, overcome the desire to play down our abilities uh, to not come across as bragging or these days as being ambitious or or you know too aggressive so how do we how do we show confidence without without um uh without being an obnoxious braggart um i think we got to get that out of our heads um because well one as men men can say men can brag and it's okay you know it's, it's a thing so women should be able to do the same thing especially if you're in an interview, if you're in an interview, your job is to sell yourself and your ability. So if a car salesman is trying to sell you a car, he's going to be telling you all kinds of stuff about this vehicle and what, exactly why you need it. Go in as a car salesman and sell yourself. You know, that is what your job is supposed to be. If you don't go in with that confidence, if you don't brag about your ability to get the job done, they may not, they may not be looking towards you. Um, but it is a fine line for men or for women. And I love 48 Laws of Power. If you haven't read 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, get it now. Um, and when I say get it now, if you don't have your library card, honey, go get you a library card and download, the, download it and listen to the audio or electronic version. I don't pay if I don't have to. That's the budget coach in me. Uh, but Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power is the first rule is never outshine the master. So you want to be confident. You want to brag about your ability, but you don't want to make that interviewer seem like or think that you're coming for his or her job, right? Like stick to the job description that you're there for and talk about your ability to be able to get that work done. Um, but that Never Outshine the Master really came important to me. And I'm so glad I read the book because I worked for a, for a boss who got his role because everybody else in the department had been laid off and he was the one that had been there the longest. So then he became the manager of all the trainers, all, all the corporate trainers. And he was not good at it. Well, I never went into meetings or made him look bad. If anything, I always made sure he was prepared, made sure he had everything that he needed, and he got all the kudos. But what happened is, is upper management saw the difference in his work once I arrived. And they were able to put two and two together that his quality of work and the department's quality of work improved when Keisha got there. So I didn't have to make it uh, known and, and put it out there that I was, you know, running circles around him. They could tell by the quality of work. And so I didn't outshine the master, but my work still shines. Well, <clears throat> That's great. That's great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments that people would like to make? I see someone asking about preparing, or Shannon's asking about preparing for situational interviews. Uh, that's the only way to get better is to practice. I mean, you can Google search oh, yeah. for behavioral interview questions. So get those mm -hmm. and then get somebody to ask you those questions. And if you feel like, you know, if you get somebody you know to ask you those questions that you won't take it as seriously or it won't be the same, then get, get a friend to have somebody you don't know call you or get on Zoom. Like get a friend of a friend that you're not as comfortable with and let them throw those questions at you and practice. And the ones that you mm -hmm. struggle on, Write those down, take note of those, come up with some more responses, really work on that, and then try again. But the only way to truly get comfortable with those is to practice. <clears throat> Very good, thank you. Uh, one of the other job clubs, Hired Texas, uh, also has a wonderful program on Tuesday mornings called Practice Makes Perfect, where they share, they brainstorm about how to answer tough questions, especially behavioral questions. So as a group, it's collaborative and it's, um, 
and it's also very helpful. So they band together on that. So that's great. Yeah. All right. Asking on behalf of a friend, how do you gain confidence besides getting in front of a mirror? Well, that's what your whole thing has been about. Uh, yeah. Um, I would say um, knowledge is power. So, you know, if you look at that job description and all the different things, and maybe there's some acronyms in there, maybe there's some programs or some different things that you, that they are requiring or that they would like for you to know about, do your research, you know, do your research about the company. If you know ahead of time who the interview person is going to be, get on LinkedIn and, you know, learn about them and, and what their job path has been like. Um, learn about all the different acronyms and the, the applications and things that are required within that job uh, description and come prepared. The more knowledge that you have um, about that company and what that role requires, um, the, the more confident you're going to be. Same thing with practicing those interview questions. Once you practice them and you're, and it's just like second nature, like what are, what is my biggest strength? That should just roll out because you, you've practiced it. You know that that's one of the top questions people are going to ask you about your strengths and weaknesses. People are going to ask you about behavioral questions. So practice, get confident in your ability to answer those questions effectively. And then that way, when you get in that situation, you know what, you have an idea of what you want to say and it's going to come out easier.